One of the things that came out of our last uh, month's discussion with Jeff, because we're going to start talking about disaster recovery from the little tiny disasters or annoyances to the big ones. Uh, we were talking about calibration of transmitters and equipment, and it was important to understand uh, what your transmitter really is supposed to do normally. I think one of the comments was that you should write down a number of the parameters periodically and make sure. And one of the letters I got said, here's uh, a cheap way to keep yourself in calibration. Periodically compare your transmitter power output meter with your indirect method. And it just seemed like such a smart thing to do. And a lot of people don't do that. Makes sense, Jeff? That comes back to the whole, uh, how often do you need to take meter readings? And the answer being as often as it takes, um, you yeah. know, to, to ensure compliance. The FCC doesn't care, but uh, I, I'd argue that having a regular schedule for taking meter readings will get you a lot closer to seeing these discrepancies before they become big issues. Yeah, that's that's exactly the point. Then. Yeah, I mean, I walked into one recently i won't say how recently given that i'm on the road and anybody that i don't want to be terrifying anybody oh he's talking about our site i'm not um but uh they were pretty obviously not running at uh at licensed power and i said uh you know um your license says you should be making this much oh no, nobody at the station knew, including their engineer, what their power should be, even though it was, the, you know, because FMs don't always have the power of the TPO on the license. They've always got the ERP, and you can look at the antenna configuration and do the math and work backwards to get pretty close. But uh, but in this particular case, the power was, the TPO was on the license, and they didn't have a transmitter big enough to make that power. Oh. So... So they hadn't been at licensed power for, for a significant amount of time. They ended up, they filed a uh, minor mod and down just downgraded the license to match what the transmitter fit because they were happy with their coverage. And that that's fine. But yeah, it's one of those little details. You know, if, if it had come license renewal time, you can inadvertently tell a fib if you uh, don't know this stuff. And, and as you said, that's a bad idea. Was that AM or FM? That was FM. Okay. Because I can't imagine an AM station voluntarily dropping power these days. Oh, I can tell you of several. Um, yeah, well, no, I mean, I mean, other are, than selling the land and, and raking in the money from the land, but no, uh, there are a pile of lower power ones running at uh, severely reduced power because they're just keeping it lit up to keep the translator active. Thank you. Hadn't thought of that. Or so, nighttime power, some, some of them to get rid of their directional. Yeah, that's where I'm talking about. Yeah, so so there are situations, and I, and I see the logic behind it, but it makes sense if you really don't have the listeners. At that point, you should probably downgrade the license and, uh, and do it. Uh, there are ways to do it legally instead of just turning it down. Yeah. Several people have commented to me about the matter of AM, and is it doomed? Uh, is there anything that you can do? And of course, the normal things about using channel five and six come up. Uh, the typical comments about uh, let's clear the bottom half of the dial and let anyone under five kilowatts go elsewhere. How about just putting something on it people want to hear and make it not sound like crap? Okay. <laughs> that, that's my summary in a nutshell <laughs> yeah hey you're the you're a manufacturer you're not supposed to talk about content you're supposed to say i want to sell you a new transmitter well and i know the plural of anecdote is not data but to give you an example my father listened to the same 900 kilohertz one kilowatt am station all the years i was growing up and he listened on a clock radio sitting on a refrigerator in the kitchen and it sounded terrible, but it had the programming he wanted to hear. So that's what he listened to. And the, the, the clock radio sitting on the fridge was the only place in the house where you could pick up that station. That's so, one. Of the, you go ahead. <laughs> now, nah, so I say that that's it. If you got something people want to hear, they'll do what it takes to hear it. That's one of the most 
uh, incredible statements I've heard. It's terribly naive. I know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a Canadian. We're optimistic by nature. This whole idea of uh, coverage pattern, uh, what's going to happen during an emergency, uh, AM being one of the best ways of getting information out. But what happens when there are problems? And that's kind of where we want to focus a little bit today, although we can meander quite a bit. And uh, I guess, Jeff, we could start with what happens when the audio stops. Well, and I mean, what brought this up, Barry pinged me repeatedly because I've been super busy and ignoring emails, and I apologize for that again, in, in public even. But uh, but he pinged me, he goes, what do we want to talk about? Well, at the moment back home, it's no secret that Halifax is currently dealing with unprecedented uh, wildfires. Uh, we've got one fire right now that is collectively burning a larger area than every single wildfire in the history of the province. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of what brought this to mind. You know, my wife for the first time ever, of course, stuff never goes sideways when I'm at home. So uh, I've been working with her over the phone and teaching her how to build a bug out bag. So, and, and this comes back and it's, I say kind of cool, coincidental, kismet, whatever. Um, I did a webinar with, uh, Charlie Wooten and Tom Morris. Um, so opposite ends of the country, opposite ends of just about everything. But uh, talking about, like, Tom had uh, had a bunch of sites lost to a wildfire in California, and Charlie, of course, went through uh, the several rounds of hurricanes a couple of years ago. And uh, so it, it's a combination of things. It, it's not just what do you do when the audio goes away, but how do you prepare to make sure that you maintain continuity as much as possible no matter what? And uh, and then what do you do when it does go away? So so it's both recovery and preparation, and that's I think historically and, and like as an example at home with the bug out bag, we don't typically prepare until the emergency happens. Is that a Canadian trait? I think it's pretty <laughs> universal. I suspect. All right. Oh, I mean, let's see. There's a lot of folks in uh, Tornado Alley. How many folks have a uh, cleaned out storm cellar as opposed to one that is uh, piled full of all the crap that uh, shouldn't really be there so you can get the people in? Sure. sure. Oh, Wilson's got his hand up. There you go. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, is going to happen here, uh, and, and one of the reasons that I keep bringing up AM is when the power goes out, what happens to the internet? Yep. yep. What happens to cell phones? That's exactly. It. You know, you can't rely on that stuff. Um, a lot of people want to go to digital AM, and that's their way of overcoming the RFI. Mm -hmm. but Which is if, great if you got a receiver. If you have a receiver. And if all you have is an analog radio in your car or your clock radio, a digital isn't going to help you any. So nope. uh, they may need to have some sort of analog component to anything emergency that continues. But uh, look, the religious entities and the uh, foreign language entities are not going to give up on AM right now because they're making a fair amount of money on it. Well, and by the same token, and, and I mean, I think at the moment there's only one manufacturer making a transmitter capable of all digital AM anyway. So uh, I think I can speak with a little bit of authority on that. I wonder who they might be. Let's... <laughs> but to convert an all-digital transmitter to analog, is it's, it's literally the flip of a switch. So, you know, yeah. so you, could, you could very much run all-digital and just let folks know, hey, if, if stuff goes sideways, we'll be, you, you'll be able to pick us up on your car or on your clock radio. It's sort of like in the HD radio when they go to a sporting event and they turn the HD off so that people can hear the crack of the baseball. and In real time as opposed to eight time. and a half seconds later, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk also about this uh, audio being the first thing. Mm -hmm. And um, up until recently, the advice would be to switch to uh, the thumb drive at the back of your transmitter. 
but the new GAUI won't handle that, will it? Not yet. Not, not yet. No. And I mean, I, I disagree with that as a, uh, as a, a, except for in a temporary stopgap, but like in an actual, an emergency situation, the last thing you want to be doing is broadcasting canned audio from a USB stick. You know, that, that's when you need somebody with a microphone, a mic processor, and a uh, plug right straight into the transmitter sitting at the site. Maybe maybe they're in a slightly quieter room, so you don't have the beehive running right on the air. But, but until but, you know, get there. Right. Until you get there. Yeah. And I mean, whether you do it that way, a lot of the um, a, a barracks extremer, you can plug a USB card with audio onto a barracks extremer and connect it direct to the transmitter. You just don't want to get to be less Nesman. The WKRP transmitter has been off the air. <laughs> hey, you could always do the eyewitness the weather. Well, I look out the window and I witness the weather. Yeah. But now, okay, we could talk about STLs and uh, the various ways, 15 ways to get audio from a studio or a remote location to a transmitter. Mm -hmm. as, you, as you say, it could be a barracks box, it could be a cell phone, it could be a computer link, depending upon what's up and running and what isn't. And at the very worst, you take an RPU and turn it around and there you are. Yeah, now you could, uh, so a lot of it depends on your specific situation. Like if you're where um, Jeff Wilson is, you're going to tend to prepare probably more for floods than wildfires. Um, if you're over where, um, see, I'm, I'm glancing around at the screen to see who's here. I mean, David and, uh, David and Rich will tend to prepare a little more for the, the occasional hurricane. Chris is going to be looking more at the fires than anything else. So it, it's very much going to be specific to your area. But I mean, these days, I'll give you an example. If you've got a pretty big market station, you could have almost an entire transmitter site in a box in a in an anvil case one of those racked up anvil cases and uh you know i mean you could have a two kilowatt transmitter you could have an audio source you could have a pump up antenna whatever it takes did so, the channel have a fleet of those at one point I, maybe they still I, do who Clear Channel, iHeart. iHeart, iHeart does have several. A um, bunch of others. University or Wisconsin State, uh, the uh, ECB has four racked up uh, transmitter, like transmitters in a portable rack, geared up to go wherever they're needed in a hurry. Um, there are a lot of other folks that do too. Yeah, I mean that's something that you could put that together for probably under ten grand, depending on the power level you wanted for the transmitter. Mm -hmm. So you know the that's yeah now if you're running close to the pocket on budget that's might not be an option but yeah, uh because you want a generator and you want to have a, a satellite you know ku band dish or something like that i mean or you put a 3000 uh, watt inverter with a big old alternator in your station vehicle and run it right straight off the truck some people could yeah. do that so again situation a little depend what you've got for, uh, for both uh, existing gear and uh, infrastructure. Does anyone make a 50 kilowatt a transmitter in a box? If you a big enough box, yeah. <laughs> but the cool right? thing, and, and looking at AM, I mean, how far will a one kilowatt signal on, uh, on 540 go? It'll go quite a ways. I remember a few years ago, somebody came out with an ad for a 50 kilowatt AM stick on. Oh, the, that was the, yeah, modified over the, after the RDL stick on stuff. That was so cool. I kept trying to get one of those and they told me they were all sold out. Yeah. The biggest yeah. And the power was... supplies were the biggest wall wart you ever saw. Well, and then the bigger challenge was fitting the three and an eighth inch flange on the thing. But no. yeah, so Jerry mentions that uh, NPR has, has a bunch of emergency stations in a box uh, via PRSS. So yeah, there are uh, there are several out there. And, and yet at the same time, we have more and more facilities, maybe because of space. They want a diplex or triplex, mm -hmm. and there's space for one transmitter. Yep. And they don't have an auxiliary anymore. Right. And I mean, the other thing that I tell folks is if I had my choice, 
over over having a main and a backup transmitter at the same site. I'd have the main transmitter at that site, maybe have several other transmitters, diplexed, whatever, and then I'd have an aux transmitter back at the studio onto a shorter tower with a one-bay penetrator or broadband antenna of some sort. And uh, that way, I don't have the eggs in one basket of uh, one single transmitter site. What happens when the tower falls down? Hmm. That's what we did in Hobbs. We had a, a frequency agile, uh, one kilowatt uh, NICOM at the studio with a two bay antenna and all the racks lined up were for each station. And you could go in and just select which station. And if you lost the other stations, you could dial up on a cell phone and you could punch a button and it would put the output of uh, all the stations. Uh, you could talk on the phone. And if you lost the other stations, you just selected the one you wanted to be on the air. So yeah. we could cover about everything unless, you know, we had to put more than one on the air. Right. And I mean, you could take it even a step further because uh, most of the current, and I mean, obviously I can only speak to my own logo, but uh, most of the transmitters out there now have some sort of audio loss detection. And like with ours, you can configure it to shut the transmitter off if it loses audio. And uh, by the same token, send an uh, alarm via SNMP and use that to trip the other transmitter to select the preset and bring it on air. So, you know, th there are options depending on, you could make it as automatic or as manual as you want it to be, but you're right. I mean, just about every low power AM or FM rather these days is is frequency agile. So having a one to many coverage or n plus one coverage is, is is so easy you know and, and again for my money i mean you know especially on fm if you've got a 100 kilowatt fm and uh you end up with a one kilowatt into a two bay you're going to cover your city license unless your studio is totally nowhere near your city license or you don't have a studio or if you're in a market like dallas fort worth or right. Los Angeles, but even Los Angeles, you can cover Dallas, Fort Worth. It's it's really hard to do. Yeah, it would depend a lot on the physical height of your tower, you know, and what you're going to have at a studio typically won't be that high. I mean, you're not, as a rule, going to have a thousand foot tower behind the studio. Jeff, but, I got distracted here. Did you say uh, uh, frequency agile AM? No, FM. Just I stuttered. Oh, okay. Yeah. I started to say AM, and then it's like, no, no, not really. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we can do a relatively easy, we've done situations with AMs where we've provided them, if they're within a specific band, you could tune them for multiple frequencies and have them marked so it's easy to change, but there's going to be physical work required regardless. Okay. Now, one of the things you've talked about over the past months and I know you like to write about this and hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> Send me an email. I'll add it to my berry folder. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the situation with uh, let's prevent fires at transmitter mm -hmm. sites. Yep. And Clear the brush back. Oh, my goodness. It's one of the things that we suck so terribly at. So, yeah. and, and, I mean, it, it's one of those things that, uh, that I've – can't tell you how many sites I've walked into where you could barely get to the transmitter building, let alone to the antennas or the tuning units or any of that stuff. You know, so this is more of a preparation. This is more a uh, yeah. before the disaster. Well, and there's two reasons. Number one, if you keep the uh, the grass and the brush trimmed down and back, you're you're reducing the um, the amount of fuel for a wildfire situation, not to mention improving the ease of access for the people that actually want to get in there. See, in my market, we don't have to worry about any of that because there's no uh, there's no station here that's uh, capable of transmitting emergency information. Uh, you know, there's just no staff to do it. Yep. Yeah. And it, it, this does require people. Right. But so what I rely on is TV because, you know, and that's going to become difficult, uh, mobile. So I rely on TV because mm -hmm. they've got a 
full new staff and meteorologists because we had a tornado come through a few years ago and uh two meter ham radio you know it's uh it's about as reliable as you can get and i'm a member of skywarn so you know we've got people all over the place reporting on you know, all kinds of emergencies not just weather but as now, far as radio is concerned no way nothing here that, and i mean when you're getting to and again looking at our specific fire hit situation i'm using a lot of uh I, I guess non-traditional media outlets um, more than the the traditional ones, and and again I'm looking at it from a distance. Uh, David makes a good comment in, in in chat that yeah you can put together a studio on the fly, you can put together a transmitter on the fly, but the connection between the two of them can be a challenge, and uh, especially if uh, if internet links are are down. So uh, yeah I, I mean it, it's a safe assumption that in a really big emergency your studio and your transmitter site need to be in the same physical location for for at least the duration of the emergency now yeah, the that, ox of, yeah an ox of some kind at the studio if it's reasonably central that will protect you from everything after the the da that's going to fail or that won't be on the ups at the studio but yeah the um uh, when we had a lot of RPUs and used them all the time, they made good emergency STLs. You could move program with them. Mm -hmm. You could you could throw a you know a, a duffel bag of stuff into the station van and head to wherever you can generate the program, which might be one of your transmitter sites. Yeah. Uh, group we yeah. used to work for, we had a bunch of AM transmitter sites, and they were on our highest land. This was Houston, and they were the most above sea level. So head to one of the AM transmitters where we. These had been manned sites, had had studios before. We had room to work, and we had built emergency studios out of all the junk that got retired. Yeah, you know, all the stuff that wasn't digital. There's more analog stuff in yeah. old cubicles out at the tower. And we'd have a wooden pole or, you know, piece of a STL tower with a couple of Yagis on it. And we'd, you know, we could feed 450 RPU to wherever. Yeah. Uh, you, would, you would have to hope somebody could get to it. Uh, Houston's neat thing was on a cluster of six or seven stations. Everything had a, a, the most important stations had multiple transmitter sites. Sure. The lesser stations might have, you know, they'd have backup transmitters. And you'd reach a point where if it goes off, make a note and we'll get to it in the next 10 days. Yeah. Um, but everything had at one time a had tuners tuned to the big station. We said, look, we're putting the most effort into keeping the mothership on the air and we have all these tuners and in the case of no other audio it would fall back to the audio from that figuring it is three transmitter sites it's going to be on mm -hmm. and rebroadcast that because if you're in an emergency hurricane earthquake tornado cleanup it is all it's all going to be the same program you're not going to sit there running seven different shows yep and uh, Brian and uh, the, there's conversation going in and chat about IP and uh, like so with the IP data links and cell phones and, and again I'll use the Halifax fires that are currently going on so when the first fire started it spread so quickly that within 12 hours of it first being announced they had 16,000 people evacuated um, so at that point, internet went down because the backbone goes through the area with the fires. Um, so internet's down for the biggest, most of the province, it was down for 24 hours. And then, uh, cell phones became almost useless as 200,000 people called 50,000 people to see if they'd been evacuated. So well, it's one of the big problems that we've seen in, uh, Boulder and Paradise, California, where the sheriff's department tries to use reverse 911 when the power and phone lines get burned in a fire and people don't get the the alerts uh, yep. reverse 911 even if they would answer it uh, to a unknown number uh, the people won't answer today so it, it's well, and that was one of the, the biggest complaints that we're hearing about now. They use 911 to announce the, the evacuations, and, and we have a, a reverse 911 over the cell phones as well. 
and uh, it was uh, sporadic at best. Some carriers were able to get through, some were not. The ones that typically were not, and this was something that I learned that I didn't know, um, typically the discount carriers that ride on the big carriers were getting uh, secondary service to the big carrier. So if, and I'm picking names, but I don't know for, for a fact that it was these companies, and I just want that on the record. But like if, if I had a uh, Cricket Wireless running on Bell Canada, then the Bell customers may get the alert, but the Cricket customers may not. So, you know, it also depends on the queue. And, and again, uh, those two specific ones, I don't know that it was a case, but uh, it does matter what QoS your provider has. But, but it will get worse now, in fact, because there are too many people who are making arrangements with cell companies for the higher uh, priority. It should go first to police and fire people, mm -hmm. but now media people are looking for it and others who uh, claim, you know, a doctor or something like that. And by the time you're done, everybody's going to have high priority and nobody will have it. Well, and it comes back to, and, and, and I'll give an example and, and not to call anybody out by name, but uh, like, like the, the, uh, I was telling Josh Bone, I said, when we were in Vegas, the, the, the Max Connect uh, modems, which are prioritized LTE, were, they worked well. But they, they weren't 100% uptime because you have got, in, in the, the West Hall, there were probably 200 of those things running at, at any given time. So you have a finite amount of bandwidth, and if it's all being lit up, it doesn't matter what the quality of service is. Yep. So, yep. you know. Exactly. And I, I'm surprised that, in a way, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more uh, competing companies uh, to this one. Uh, for several reasons, but uh, that's that's a that's a very good one. But let's get back to the site and uh, making sure there's not enough brush to cause a fire. Mm -hmm. What else would cause a fire in a transfer building? Well, I mean, you, you got the obvious stuff. If you've got a lot of dust build up or, or just like paper and crap laying around the uh, the building itself. Um, I was at a site last week where there were piles and piles of cardboard and uh, flammable stuff just basically piled up inside the fence perimeter outside the building. So, uh, yeah, not just the brush, but just uh, clean the stuff up. Well, and, my, uh, first, uh, my first month in San Diego, we had a, a major fire. Someone threw a cigarette butt out uh, Route 8, and small fires started by the road, and then very quickly ran up a canyon, took out an entire section of the city. Mm -hmm. north. Now, what the fire department was recommending was first that you clear the brush, but even more important was that you plant ice plant, because the stuff is loaded with water. Hmm. And it'll keep you, it'll keep the fire away. Uh, yep, or, or yeah, by basically suppressing as the fire tries to burn it. Right. Yeah. Oh, and one of the other things, and, and somebody had mentioned in a, in a message, that, you know, I mean, some transmitters just by design run hotter than others. So if you uh, have an, an air, a, a perfect example, if you've got an older tube rig with the, with the squirrel cage blower and somebody's bypassed the airflow interlock, and that blower fails, things are going to get toasty and melt down, you know, as one example. So definitely you need to pay attention to that sort of thing as a, rel a regular and maintenance. You are going to be changing out air filters uh, soon, aren't you? Typically, yeah. From the, the smoke? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that, that and it's funny because uh, even though I hadn't been aware, well, obviously the, the fires hadn't started when I left home a week and a half ago, but I had just replaced the furnace filters with, uh, and I, in the summertime, because we use our, we use forced air heat. So in the summertime, I use the furnace as a ventilation system to bring cool air from the cellar upstairs and cool the house. So in, during that period, I tend to run uh, much uh, higher density filters. So I run uh, 1500 uh, micron instead of 800 micron like I do in the winter. So I just put the uh, the high density filters in right before I left. So that'll be uh, helping keep the air cleaner in the house while I'm gone. 
and will need replacing as soon as you get back. Absolutely, yep. Because you can only crap or stuff so much carbon into something before it uh, stops uh, passing air. Now, in in the old days with an FM, if the PA died for whatever reason, uh, you often were able to take your exciter and plug it into the uh, antenna. Mm -hmm. But with the solid state transfers today, that is not really an option, is it? With some it is, with some not so much. Um, Definitely know what you've got. And again, that comes back to the argument for having an aux transmitter. I mean, these days you can get a 150 watt transmitter for a couple of grand. You know, and I mean, couple is relative. Like Jeff's over there on the other screen. He's just cringing when I start mentioning numbers. But uh, but yeah, it, it, um, it it's arguably less expensive to get a complete lower power uh, aux transmitter in a lot of cases than it would be to get an exciter. So, yeah, you know, situational again. If you've got a 50-watt exciter, 50-watt exciter will cover some territory if you get it up high enough. Right, right. So uh, we we think about this. I mean, usually if you get a fire in the back of a uh, Nautel, the transmitter is not going to work at all at that point. Um, I suppose you could take the exciter output and, and give it a push, but uh, having the having this the small guy, and let's face it, a hundred watts or a kilowatt on a hundred kilowatt station, a kilowatt on a hundred, mm-hmm. is going to pretty much cover the same area. Well, what do they say? The last ninety uh, percent of your power covers the last ten percent of your audience. Yes, sir. That's right. Which comes to another discussion that I, I would like to have. Uh, from an antenna manufacturer about what uh, criteria to use in buying a new antenna or replacing one. Mm -hmm. But now, what happens if the antenna is what got hit? What can you do with a Nortel transmitter, let's say? Can you run into a coat hanger? So if you ran it into a coat hanger, it wouldn't go anywhere anyway. Um, not sure that'd be a benefit. But uh, I guess that's a, a loaded question. If we're talking AM, I mean, the first thing I'd do, go out and buy a couple hundred feet of clothesline and make a long wire. Just uh, use a rock tied to a string or, or whatever to get it up into a tree. I've had uh, J1000s running into a 200 foot long wire for the better part of two years while they got a tower rebuilt. So there, there'd be one example. If you're running a FM, you're going to want to put some kind of antenna up there. You got to radiate the signal. I mean, and again, the coat hanger isn't going to radiate a signal. I know I'm being literal and you may not, maybe weren't being, but, uh, yes, I was could, being facetious. Yeah, you could grab, though, an antenna. The antenna wouldn't necessarily have to be at your frequency. Um, you could take one for another frequency, and, I mean, you're going to see a lot of reflected, but it might get you a signal out there. If you've got the money for your main antennas at your FM sites, um, I always had, and if I didn't, I would try to get a broadband ERI. Because even if you lose a couple of bays, you can run lower watts into it, and it'll cover pretty well the whole damn band at low power. Now, this would be the question I would pose to Rich Wood if he had been in a smaller market. Mm -hmm. I don't think think this will apply. But we had here in Tucson uh, not too many years ago a fire that got started. And it went up the whole Catalina Mountains and right up to Mount Bigelow and Mount Lemon, where all the transmitters were, took all the power lines out. And um, one of the radio stations here, which was licensed to a town on the north side of the mountains, took a van to the middle of Tucson and broadcast off an exciter and a little antenna the automation. Same hits, same commercials. And yeah, the city of license didn't hear a thing. 
That I might argue with, but uh, I, I mean, you know, from a from a public service perspective, that that's kind of pointless. But hey, yep. Uh, and on the other hand, may not be illegal if it stays inside the protected contour of the real station, and you get around to asking for an STA. There's not a rule that you cover your city of license with an ox. It'd be yeah. nice. But again, the whole the, within the protected contour thing is, is important. Um, one other thing, you were talking antennas and coat hangers and stuff. Um, I know you had Steve on recently, and, and it'd be interesting to know if AAT is going to continue making and selling the uh, Shively Versatune, because that was an awesome little antenna for, for stuff like this. You could have it flat packed in a box, and then you could set it up and tune it by just instructions, no measurement required, just set the slugs to this depth, and bang, you're on frequency. I had, a brief, I had a brief conversation with Steve earlier this week, and mm -hmm. although I didn't touch that specific point, he did say that they're going to continue selling all of the Shively uh, uh, stock. Cool. So, you know, not to uh, not to pump up any one brand over another, but the Versatune is very uniquely suited to this specific type of requirement where if you wanted a, a whole transmitter site in a box, you could slap like any frequency agile low power transmitter, a couple of feet of superflex or a couple of hundred feet of superflex, whatever, and a Versatune antenna. Um, add that to a pump up master, a telephone pole, and you're pretty much done. Now, uh, broadcasters have a kind of a tradition of cooperating with each other in emergencies. Now, what would stop stations from like if you get a, a tower, letting a competing station put an antenna and, you know, maybe a small transmitter shack on your property and, you know, kind of swap it so that you have something. I've got customers doing exactly that thing where two stations in a market will each have their backup and their licensed stocks at the other station's transmitter site. Yeah, that makes more sense to me. Yep. We, we did that in Dallas in 1985 when the... F-16 or whatever uh, jet hit the candelabra and uh, wiped out several antennas. Uh, we let one of the FM stations that was up there come over to the Susquehanna Tower and uh, pipe into our uh, backup antenna. And Continental was just down the road, so we got a little 8-kilowatt transmitter. And uh, and they went over in a truck and picked it up and brought it to the site. Norman Phillips and I got uh, KZEW back on the air in about five hours at reduced power, but they were on the air. On's on. Yeah, Charles got um, KSCS on using the K Eagle Ox over, not at Chan. Well, they at not Channel Eleven, but that two way tower that was behind it, seven hundred footer that was right behind it. The old, uh, that was that station that had the studios down by the phone company on Ross Avenue. It was some K non K2. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Now, somebody mentioned earlier that it was uh, more difficult to uh, cover Dallas Fort Worth than it was Los Angeles. And that puzzles me a little bit because Los Angeles is mountainous and Dallas Fort Worth is flat. Dallas Fort Worth has actually surpassed Los Angeles and land area. It is now the largest mass nonstop occupied land area in the country. Yeah, the and Dallas it's Dallas, flat yeah. land. It's flat land and it's relatively get, flat. Yeah, relatively. But, but flat. also at, at in LA, you have other mountains to use. You can go to Flint Peak and cover much, but not all. Even at Wilson, it works better at one end of the hill than the other for different locations. But if you're in Dallas, if if Cedar Hill had a fire uh, on days when you even if you have a good enough power failure, there is no other place to be. If you're not there at 1,500 feet, uh, you're kind of in trouble. Yeah, and you're 1,500 feet. You're on the highest ground in the area, and you're smack dab south centrally located between dallas and fort worth yeah yeah and even the the big failing at wilson turned out to be you can have fires suddenly not be able to access the place or you better hope your the generator tank is fuel is full because you may not be able to get jobbers up there you know for several days but yeah dallas's problem is 
If you're not at Cedar Hill, you have to decide which part of town you're covering, although that is the nature of a lot of kinds of disasters. If you have an earthquake, that's area wide. If you have a tornado, that is rarely, that's not even a county. That's very often up and down one length of street. Norman, Oklahoma may be in ruin. Oklahoma City could not tell the difference. In L.A., you've got, and New York, you've got, or Chicago, you've got tall buildings downtown that can pretty much cover the entire marketplace. Dallas Fort Worth's not like that. You'd have to put at least, if you couldn't get to Cedar Hill, you'd have to have a an antenna in downtown Dallas and one in downtown Fort Worth, and then suffer when the two signals got together in between. Well, I was in Dallas in the seventies. So apparently it's grown quite a bit. Oh, a lot. Yeah. I mean, even in the early 90s, last time I was there, Dallas and Plano were two separate cities. Now you can't tell where one stops and one begins. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. yeah. It's tough to be a 100% spare, but we're not necessarily talking about that. We're talking about serving a population that's been damaged by whatever emergency we have. You have a fire that could be area wide. Uh, the hurricane, certainly area wide, but, uh, yeah. And, and that's what I say it, uh, I mean, again, it comes down to probabilities and, uh, and, and infrastructure. I mean, as I was saying up home with the fires, I mean, this is a first time in recorded history event for us. So I suspect not too many people were, were all that prepared for it. I, I know it, it is uh, taxed our infrastructure way beyond its ability to cope, and uh, we're importing fire crews from New Hampshire at the moment. Well, so, and, you know, uh, Western Mass is smelling your smoke. Sorry about that, but uh, yeah. So, and I mean, the, the other thing to look at too is, I mean, the preparation is the one thing, but what do you do after the event? And that was one of the things when we did the webinar. And by the way, if you go to resources and webinars on our website, you can you can find the one. Just type in disaster uh, recovery. I think we'll we'll see the one that I did with Charlie and Tom. But one of the things they focused on was was after the fact, taking a deep breath and, and start to make lists of the tasks you need to accomplish to get a signal or get your coverage back on. And, and that's because uh, sometimes you can get kind of overwhelmed by the uh, the sheer magnitude of the task. And you have to move fast right after something like that, because while it's happening, management will do anything. Mm-hmm. And then as they get back on the air, they kind of start forgetting that. So that's the one thing. But also after it happens is when the people tend to need the information the most. Well, I had a, a production director at uh, Extra that ended up working in New Orleans and uh, was working as as chief of, I think, three or four stations. And Katrina hit. He was fired because he wouldn't stay at a transmitter site when the water kept rising. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. And and so you got to, there's definitely got to be some expectation management put in there, like... uh, you know, somebody, I was having this discussion, and I say I'm at a trade show right now, so I will be dropping out in about, uh, well, pretty close to the top of the hour, if not a hair before. But uh, somebody was mentioning today that it, it's more, it, it's really important. We've historically prioritized work over anything. And, and it is important to realize that, uh, you know, th- it's personal safety should play a factor in here. You don't, uh, you don't get a lot of second chances. And um, one of the other things, and, and this goes back a few years, I was uh, at the TAB, well, I've been there many times, but this was a bunch of years ago. And uh, at the TAB, uh, one of the uh, senior iHeart guys was complaining that, because uh, I'd been talking to a, somebody who was complaining that uh, after Katrina, they couldn't find a generator anywhere. And one of the senior iHeart guys happened here, and he goes, we've got trailers with generators waiting for some people to call us and ask. And uh, and and so that's the other thing. Reach out, talk to each other. Um, as uh, as uh, David said earlier, broadcasters will tend to cooperate in an emergency, or maybe Rich mentioned that. But uh, 
but yeah, th th there's a long history of that. You can be as competitive as you want to during ratings, but uh, if a hurricane comes by, it's all hands on deck. Right. The WPIG uh, offered their spare transmitter to K R K uh, W K R P. They did want a couple of grand. Uh, Carlson asked a month. The guy said a week. Yeah. Oh, swine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And the air filters were full of feathers. When Rita followed up uh, Katrina by two or three weeks, it had been on top of everyone's mind. Everyone had some friend or, you know, some sister station that was in the, in the middle of it. When it came to Houston, we were all in Philly at the radio show. And, uh, you know, there were 10 directors of engineering in a restaurant. Uh, BE was, had taken us to dinner and, we were all in the corner saying, okay, at seven tonight, we are going to whatever our low power setting at Missouri City is. If you could go to one quarter power, one third power remotely, that's what we all did just to stretch out the fuel supply. Mm -hmm. And just, it was one uh, of those, it was one of those to make it a little more palatable for program directors. You say, we're all doing it. Yeah. Jeff, before we have to lose you uh, back to the floor. Uh, tell us now, suppose there's a complete meltdown, whether the transmitter melted down or the building got whacked or just what, and we need a new transmitter. Mm -hmm. What is the situation on new product right now? Varying. Um, and that, that's the best way to put it. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. I had a guy needing a, I think it was a VX600, might have been a one kilowatt last week. I got the order on a Tuesday. I was up to my ears with stuff Wednesday, and, and to be honest, it slipped my mind. So Wednesday evening, I sent it off to Jen and Krista with a little apology saying, hey, I kind of dropped the ball, but he's off the air. What can you do? Um, he had an order acknowledgement Thursday morning, did a wire transfer of the funds Thursday afternoon, and 25 and a half hours after the order was processed, we shipped a transmitter. So... At, at the low powers, now, I'm not going to commit to doing that on a daily basis because parts situations are still very fluid. But uh, in at low power levels, we can get stuff out a lot faster than we used to be able to. I, I'd like to quote two to, two to eight weeks, which is a big range, but it gives me some flex. High power stuff, we're still probably, it's getting better, but it's still out there around 16 weeks. So, Dude. you know. Better than twenty, but better, but uh, still not where we want it. Uh, so, if somebody did have a complete meltdown, would you be able to send them out a kilowatt while they waited for a ten? Yeah. Oh yeah. And I mean, we've done that. Uh, customer service has a fairly big rental fleet that they can get out to get somebody back up in an emergency. We've got uh, relationships like uh, established with several of the. Uh, of the contract engineering firms out there who have uh they've also got loaner transmitters and rentals so there, there are options and it's and not we'll... ten thousand dollars a week though no. <laughs> no and you can't replace that two megawatt in europe i could if i had to wouldn't you, be you, stereo you oh yes it would <laughs> now all of our am gear has am stereo built in you kidding absolutely it could be stereo if you wanted it I'm going to imagine that the loaners particularly are at FM and not AM. Typically, yes, although we do have a couple of J1000s in the rental fleet at all, so I can do a one kilowatt AM in a, if I need to. Um, that one, I'm not getting that out the door the next day. It takes a little while to put it on frequency, but but yeah, a couple, three days, we can do it. Now, and I'll qualify because the rental stock, typically we usually only have three or four of them available. And depending on demand, if we have a really bad lightning season, then um, I, I could have all three of them on the road. But uh, so it does very much depend on availability. But but yeah, we we do carry AM and FM as well. But still, going back to the start, almost start of our discussion, mm -hmm. stations would be well advised uh, to have an N plus one, or if they're yep. in a building with two or three other stations. Uh, maybe it might be a shared N plus one. 
Right. I mean, I live in an area where there is zero public transit, uh, way out in the woods. And uh, my wife and I each have vehicles. You know, if we lived in the city or when I lived in a city, neither I didn't have a vehicle at all. So, yeah, again, situational. But if you are making all your revenue from the RF generator sending the signal up the hill, then you need to have enough backups that when the electrons stop flowing, you've got an alternative. Well, and when I was with Susquehanna, we owned that tower. We bought the tower at Cedar Hill. And so when we put up our aux, we asked all the other people on the tower if they wanted to be in on our broadband backup. Yep. And the ones that did, uh, we raised their rent a bit and they got to be on it. Yeah, I've run into situations where a couple of stations in town will um, decide on a place to put an aux transmitter and then cost share the price of the transmitter. And I mean, now, as long as you don't, again, as somebody mentioned earlier, as long as you don't have a situation where you need them both at once, then, then you're covered. But on that note, I do have to drop out. So I thank you very, very much for the time today. Well, thank you, Jeff. As always, we enjoy seeing you and hearing your experiences. I would have loved for us to have had a few more days of, of uh, advanced notice and maybe you could have showed us some horror story pictures, but <laughs> maybe uh, another time. I will definitely keep that in mind. We'll do another, maybe we'll do it next month and uh, we'll, we'll call it a best of the worst sort of session. All right. Sounds good. Very cool. Well, thank you. Enjoy the show. Yeah, I'll see you.